Uh, good afternoon. This is your host, Guillermo Sabadilla, Director of International Services sorry, at uh, HSI. And today I'm your host for Perspectives on Energy here at ThinkTech Hawaii. And thank you for joining us. So today we'll be talking about the um, eclipse uh, that happened uh, recently. And uh, of course, I went through the mainland, the winter cut across from Texas all the way through the Great Lakes, diagonally from, uh, from the south, all the way up to the northeast. And uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Labs, had a uh, study on how, for example, ERCOT, just Texas, was affected by this particular um, eclipse. Basically, it's, it's losing sunlight for maybe a good half an hour uh, of the day. So one of the things I wanted to compare and study was uh, what, how that impacts uh, the photovoltaic output, right? Meaning all these solar farms and to see how that has an impact on, on grid reliability and how does that, that has an impact on the redispatching. So let's, let's dive right in. Let's go ahead and go to the next, second slide. So the next slide. Okay, so here in this slide, we're looking at the, uh, the beginnings of the actual uh, eclipse, right? You're not quite there yet. That happened at around uh, just uh, you know local time was two in the afternoon. And you can tell uh, all the different like PV generation sites. You know the largest ones are 800 megawatts and 400, 200, and they're scattered all around Texas. You know, and Florida has some, California has some, but Texas has some really big ones. So the uh, the epicenter there was going to really start through Texas and move its way diagonally into the north northeast and hit the Great Lakes, right? Uh, in the very bottom right on that graph, we're seeing an example of, for example, of the utility photovoltaic output and how that looks regarding um, dispatch. So one of the things we're noticing on that particular like uh, slide there is that you see the uh, distribution photovoltaic in orange, and then you have the utility scale photovoltaic. So what's the difference? This distributor is, is uh, the stuff behind the meter, right? Uh, customer rooftops, that sort of thing. The other is the utility scale stuff, and that's that's uh, what we really focus on a lot in our industry, right? So, uh, mind you, at the very bottom of the slide is it, uh, going to be the site where you can go find this entire study, and it's part of the Department of Energy, so it's open to everybody. And, and NRL is a really good uh, lab that does all these studies. So here we had the actual. Uh, I think it was it was a certain time before it began. Uh, right at the point where it begins to happen. So if we go to the next slide, you're going to see how the shading is beginning to occur and just a slight amount of decrease right on that. And if you notice, you know, it's got, got a little bit darker. And again, if you go to the site, you can see the whole YouTube video where that, that uh, particular uh, event, it shows a time lapse of how it's impacted, right? And how it impacts the output and how... Uh, the shading is, is shown across the uh, the U.S. Right? So now you're noticing a slight decrease right now. And this is the very beginning of the actual drop. So if you see at that bottom left-hand graph, you're seeing how the photovoltaic output now begins to decrease. Right? And we're not to the bottom yet. Eventually, we're going to see how far we're going to get uh, once that happens. And then, of course, um, one of the things that you also want to take note of as well on this graph is the Eclipse PV generation reduction, right? So on the inverse of that graph, it shows you how much was, was cut out, right? And it is quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of generation in gigawatts. Uh, here you're looking at almost 50 gigawatts of power that have been reduced on this particular day because of that. Go to the next slide, please. And now we are in the throes of this event in Texas. It is like you see how. The middle of the state is kind of the darkest part of the, the actual event. Uh, we're noticing how, and I'm looking at different screens here, but you're noticing how it, it happens. It just so happens that this was at, um, at this time, you notice noticing 1800 hours. So uh, from the event, and then you're noticing how also that dark spot right in the middle, right? Uh, it's in the, in the border between Texas and Oklahoma. You're seeing how that is, the utility photovoltaic has been dropped to its lowest point. So this is already way past 59.5, 59.6 gigawatts is what they've lost, which is a considerable amount of power, right? Especially in the middle of the day. Uh, we were in Virginia watching this thing and we got to experience some of it, but you know, not quite the same as what they saw in Texas. And uh, so definitely quite a bit of power that was reduced in this case. 
And is it, it now, mind you, it didn't make the news and nothing really bad happened. They had enough power to redispatch. They had enough of the conventional generation running to be able to make up for that loss, right? Um, this imagine is one giant cloud covering an entire state. Well, that's what you would get. The majority of the solar, uh, half of the solar output was lost at that time, as you can see there. Go to the fifth slide, please. Next slide. So in this case, you can see how this thing finally went away. Now it's over there by the northeast of the U.S. And it, it, it still hasn't returned. Uh, it's, it's halfway up again when, when you look at, the, at that bottom left-hand graph of power being restored. In this case, you know, you went from 56 back to 31. So you recovered about 12, a little bit under 20 gigawatts, but you have not recovered everything. Also, you notice that uh, distributed energy resources also lost, lost quite a bit of output, right, on the orange graph. So it's a very interesting phenomenon, and we lost quite a bit of quite a bit of output in that in that case, and that's really went over for like maybe half an hour to an hour in that case. Go to slide number six. We are back to uh, normal output now. Mind you, this is already way past the event, and it's already happened, and the, the totality is over right now. Right? So now we're seeing that all these solar sites are once again producing their their typical power for for this part of the day, the remainder. So so what happens to the rest of the system when this is taking place? Right, mind you, there. They're looking at, um, they, there's quite a bit of planning happening here, quite a bit of a, dispatchable resources. They, they brought a bunch of other generation units in their mixed portfolio to see what took place and what they ran in order to offset that deficit that they had in solar. So let's go ahead and go to slide number seven. And here we're noticing that uh, what they did when it comes to maximum PV reduction, right, and generation redispatch. It says dispatch, but really it's redispatch in this case, right? We're looking at how we had um, uh, so the different regions: WAC, Eastern Interconnection, and ERCOT. ERCOT really pretty much had was was the one that had the greatest impact or felt the greatest impact, where they actually lost nine nine three point two percent of their uh, PV reduction at that point. So that's fifteen point two gigawatts at that point. So. Uh, Eastern, Eastern Interconnection that's seventy percent, and the WAC. Dropped down by forty five point one percent. So definitely, definitely a huge impact. But of course, that's that's seen more sharply in Texas because Texas has one of the largest uh, EV. Um, well, it has the most one of the most EV facilities out there. I mean, so not EV photovoltaic facilities out there in the uh, in in of all the interconnections, right? So what happens in this case, right? So you notice here in this case, we lost, for example, the um, yeah, photovoltaics and, and the, really is, when I say gigawatt hours, remember gigawatts versus gigawatt hours, watts versus watt hours here, they're measuring over, over time. So here you're looking at a loss of 35.3 gigawatt hours for this particular event. So what did you run in to replace all that? Or they ran natural gas units, that's at 17.2 gigawatt hours, that's 30% of that deficit. They ran uh, pumped hydro, which is a great asset to have. That's your tried and true battery, uh, which is it's water in one reservoir, water in the lower reservoir, and they exchange that and they generate power. So that was uh, 24 gigawatt hours. And then hydro made up the rest mostly, and then that was at 13.5 gigawatt hours. And then you have some steam and oil gas steam systems right there. But the point is that having that sort of like mixed portfolio really made a big difference when it came to their output. And what's important to realize here is that this is an, an event where they saw coming for a long time. They prepared for it. They had their forecasts. They had enough time to plan ahead. And the challenge there is that, you know, right now you're in the middle of what they call the shoulder months. So right now is when they're doing the majority of their uh, majority of their maintenance cycles. A lot of units are on overhaul. They may not be available. And if you want to make them available, you, you're going to need some time to have them put all that back together again. Because for the most part, whenever you have a unit on overhaul, you have a situation where they basically turn up the whole machine uh, and because they're, they're doing their annual maintenance. So that usually happens in the spring, happens in the fall. And the reason that they do that is because there's not that much demand. Now, if you lose this much of a resource because of an eclipse, now, that this is something you would need to plan ahead, and you know it's coming, so you can plan ahead to do that, right? Now, that's uh, that week. Now, this week, for example, uh, we're, that was about what, 10 day, uh, about 10 days ago. 
uh, today's the 18th. So uh, uh, right now, this week, uh, I know ERCOT is having some some struggles to meet their load based on the fact that they have record heat, they don't have enough resources, and they're issue they're about to issue energy emergency alerts. So they're one, two, or three. They haven't issued a three yet, but they're they're definitely issuing alerts, and it is a concern, right? Because you know they're they're it's because of all the heat and all the load. Now, if that were the case, let's go to the next slide. Now, here you're seeing system and demand generated loading, right? In this case, so once again, the whole diversity, right? Diversity of resources is what really matters here. Um, it's great to have renewables. It's great to have a lot of them. Problem is, when when you, when you have so much of one type of of, gener of generation, uh, an event like this pretty much proves that you you have a lot of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, and it puts you in in, in somewhat of a bind when it comes to reliability. Which is why it's important to have, for example, that diversity where they have combined cycles, simple cycles, pump storage, a great resource to actually have as a the power system. Pump storage really is 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 a tried and true battery resource, and it is really energy storage. I think of it as hydro, but you, it's really renewable. You, you can pump that water back up, use that as load when you have a problem with um, with too much generation, especially in the valley or at night, or you have too many renewables, where well, you can use that to go ahead and pump that water back up there. Basically, that is the way you store energy. So those really those really had an important role in this particular like effort. Um, a lot of the the regular steam, I'm um, sorry, a lot of the combined cycle plants, again, as usual, they, they're they pretty numerous, reliable, effective, and they respond quickly. It's important to have those. So uh, I understand the need to get rid of coal and oil burning plants, but we might want to hold on to a, a lot of our cleaner burning natural gas sites, such as those combined cycle sites, because they can definitely keep you running a little longer. And the fact is you get a lot more reliability. So, so what is an EEA, Energy Emergency Alert? And they may be issuing those this week, um, this week or maybe next week in Texas and some other parts of the country. So Energy Emergency Alert, and that's according to some of the NERC standards, is uh, you have an alert level one. It means you are meeting uh, both your, your, your load in blue, and you can stand, for example, you have that spinning, that reserve, meaning that you, you can meet your all your demand, all your load, and you can also withstand the loss of your most severe single contingency, meaning that the biggest unit that you have to find in your system trips offline, you can still survive without it. And you have enough power to, serve, to survive that and still serve all of your customers in that time. And that would be an EEA-1, meaning that, you know, hey, you're running pretty tight, but you're basically running flat out with everything you got available, but yet you're meeting all your load. So anything beyond that, you're going to be in a different type of level of uh, emergency alert, which brings us to energy, uh, emergency energy, uh, energy emergency alert level two. So in this case, the EEA two uh, puts us in a situation where now you are you are still meeting out of your customer demand, but you cannot withstand your most severe single contingency. Meaning that if you lost that large generator, that's the biggest one you've got in your system, you will not have enough power to, to uh, be able to feed all your customers. Meaning that you will have to shed some of those customers to be able to survive. So in this case, now you're doing, you're taking other other measures to cut back on load, whether you're asking for appeals, hey, like for example, don't charge your vehicles at this time. Maybe turn your air conditioners up a little warmer. Um, maybe turn off some of your unused lighting. Uh, send employees home early. So any any public appeals, any other like thing you might be doing to reduce demand or, or load is something that if you're employing that, you're in a EEA level two. Also, if you're doing what they call a uh, load reduction, which is the demand side management, that's usually one of those. Uh, programs that customers get on, they forget about, you get an extra five, 10, 12 bucks a month. And then what it is really is to um, disable your air conditioner, water heater, cool pumps, and the utility will do that. And that, that definitely has a pretty significant impact, right? On reducing the overall load. And they do that for a good 10, 15, 20 minutes to an hour. And most customers don't notice it, right? But some of them that do, they decide to go ahead and get off the program all, you know, all together. But you know, they forget to realize they don't realize that, you know, if if they're using that at that time, it means they're they're about that pretty close to having a, a 
rotating feeders, which would be an EEA level three. And in an EEA level three, you're now at the point where you have everything running, you bought all the power you can buy, you've done everything you can, <clears throat> and you still cannot meet all your customer load, <laughs> which means you're now at a point where, forget about uh, surviving if you, if you lose your largest unit, you're now at a point where you're going to have to start shedding load because even with everything running, you don't have enough to be able to like supply all your customer loads. So that means you're getting into what they call brownouts or rotating, uh, doing rotating feeders, or you, you're going to be turning some customers off and on uh, for 10, 20, 20 minutes, and you're going to rotate through your entire customer, I guess, uh, list to be able to survive the day in this case, right? And and usually this goes on during you know during the uh, afternoon hours where it's the hottest, and then once the sun goes down, people start going home from work. We usually five. That's when things kind of like wind down, and that peak is over, and then people head home. So that's the other challenge when it comes to uh, comes to the, this particular event. So the whole point here really is that they they so again again to recap, Enro did the study uh, on behalf of the Department of Energy to see how the eclipse would impact all of these photovoltaic resources during one of these events. And the important thing we saw is that they did pretty well. They, they, they had time to plan. They were able to put on all, all of these other resources that have a diversity of, a, of prime move, diversity of source, meaning whether it's natural gas, they have hydro, they have some other, they had some winds, right? But even the wind was affected. So, uh, which, which, which again, highlights the fact that, you know, that relying on only one source of uh, our, you know, it's if it's renewables, great in some regards, but then it also makes you vulnerable to some of these events, right? So, but anyway, so um, hopefully this shed some light on what happened. I, I think it was a pretty interesting phenomena. It was a really cool thing to study, and I'm really glad Enro did that. Once again, at the very bottom of that page, of each one of these slides, you have the uh, the website for Enro, and they have a pretty cool YouTube video that shows you the actual time lapse, and it's pretty interesting to watch. So uh, again, that is all I have for today. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining. If you have any questions or any comments, please go ahead and put them in the comments below and I'll try my best to answer them. And once again, have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.